All right, now we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Hi, so uh, my name is M. Scott Boone. I am um, a writer, uh, these days primarily nonfiction. Uh, I'm also a um, uh, associate professor and uh, associate dean uh, at a law school um, and an intellectual property attorney uh, who's uh, specialized for 15 or so years in representing artists and authors. So that's why I'm here. I'm Lee Modisett, and I've write, written a few books along the way. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect the reason I'm on this panel is because I'm one of the few who does not have an agent and consequently I have spent a long time dealing directly with those contracts. Uh, my name again is Michael Brent Collings. I'm an internationally best-selling novelist. I'm one of the top indie horror writers in the United States. I write screenplays and movies as well. Um, I've never had an agent either. I used to be a contract litigator though. Um, so we know a little bit between us. We know hopefully a little bit about contracts. I, we're going to spend a lot of time on you guys' questions because I think that'll be valuable. Um, but just to get started, and we'll start here and just kind of travel down. Um, you get a contract. Hooray. <laughs> What's, what's your, your first thing you should know? I think the first thing you should know is, no matter how boring it looks, no matter how long 25 pages look, read the whole damn thing word for word. And if it gets boring, sit there and read it aloud. Because you can't ask questions, you can't even start to think about it, unless you actually know what all that stuff they put there for. Yeah, uh, that's really good because like when, I, when we were in law school, what, what you walk around with the first couple of years is Black's Law Dictionary, which is a dictionary for the alternate universe language that is contract and statute ease. So if you don't know a word, you're going to have to look it up, but you should read it. Um, one of the most important things I found as far as contracts is most writers are this bizarro mix of narcissism and cripplingly low self-esteem. <laughs> so everyone's like, I'm gonna write a book that's gonna be a million dollars and people are gonna buy it and I'm gonna sign all sorts of body parts and be a rock star. And then somebody gives you a contract and you're like, for me? <laughs> and you sign it immediately, yeah, okay. So before you even start to look at the contract, you should have three things in mind. You should have what you will be thrilled with, what you will deal with and be happy, and what you'll walk away from. Because if you go in there without that, the more you spend negotiating, the more they're going to wear you down. And literally, if you're like, I'll take 500 bucks, if they give you 499.99, have decided to walk away. Okay, because that will inform your contract reading and your contract negotiation. Um. I think what you need to know before you look at the contract is exactly what copyright is and what you understand. Because this is, other than your reputation, your name, your ability, your skills as a writer, what you have that is actually most often legally protected as a property right is the copyright. So a copyright is not some singular monolithic right that you transfer or don't transfer, right? You want to think of copyright as a bundle of sticks. And when you enter into a contract, you're not necessarily giving all the bundle of sticks to uh, the publisher. You might just be taking, you know, this one for the publisher, or this one. And about half the clauses are going to in some way deal with these sticks in this bundle. How long the, you're giving them for, what exactly you're getting for, what you get paid, if they use them, uh, when they might come back to you, uh, all of that. But you have to understand that copy with... <clears throat> you have to understand that you can license these separately, right? So I might just license the right for certain types of books just in North America to one party, that's the stick to this publisher. For uh, UK, this stick might go to another publisher. And if you give it all away, the entire bundle, when they're only paying you for one part of it, then you've lost out. And we go into more detail as we go through it. You gotta understand what that is. I want to yeah. add something to that. <clears throat> One of the things you ought to, ought to also understand is what your markets are composed of. Because, it, as you were pointing out, there are different aspects of copyright, and those different aspects are worth different things. There is a certain market for hardcover, 
there is a certain market for, if you will, e-books. There is a certain market for foreign rights. There is a certain market for film rights, for audio rights. They all aren't worth the same. Okay, so uh, let's talk about one thing you've seen that's a hazard that new writers need to be aware of. We'll start here. Oh, uh, the hazard that you need to be aware of. Uh, the most, I think the, the biggest one right now are going to be either option clauses, right of refusal clauses. Uh, they have a number of different names. But basically it's a clause that says, uh, we the publisher have the right to, uh, to look at and buy your next work. Okay? These are particularly dangerous because they tend to be very overreaching in their first draft of the contract. And in, in, a, in a publishing universe where most of, a lot of authors are going to sort of a hybrid approach or going to multiple publishers, um, you can really overly restrict yourself in a bad deal. Um, and so I don't know if we want to go fully into everything you should think about yeah, for we a can writer. Address, but, yeah, but we'll that, address that's, that's, that's one of the biggies okay. right Okay, and I would, I would come up with another one that's a really big one. And that is, it's going to sound really dumb. You've just gotten a contract, and I'm going to say, look at the out-of-print clause. Because you don't think about it being out-of-print. But with e-print right now, if you don't have a clause that has in it a key number of how many e-books e constituted being in or out of print, you are screwed. Because if you don't have a good out-of-print clause, they can hold on to it forever and not pay you a dime. What that means is, like most, a lot, not most, but very many contracts will have will say after a certain number of years you get the rights back and you can sell it again uh, to whoever you want. But a lot of them say you can sell it, you can get the rights back after it goes out of print. Well if that's defined as meaning more than 25 copies sold electronically, more than 50 copies sold hardcover, it goes back to you. But if it just says out of print, guess what? Electronically, they can always just, in print. You can just send yourself one for a buck fifty every year and keep it forever. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and a lot of big publishers that as they become more corporate tend to view uh, a copyright right as an asset. So they actually are very low to get rid of it, even if they're not doing anything with it. Yeah. Okay? And so this is also some kind of called the reversion clause, because it's what tells you when you transfer all the copyright rights when you have the right to get them back. And, and it used to be for out of print, when we're only talking about physical books before ebooks, it actually cost the publisher something to keep it in print, right? Offset printing costs money, um, warehousing it costs money, and so they had incentives to go, go ahead and let it go if it was going to go out of print. Nowadays, with ebooks, and not only for ebooks you have to watch out for, but a few publishers are starting to do print on demand mm -hmm. and saying that satisfies the, uh, the in print clause. You have to look at both, uh, you have to be careful of both. So here's my gotcha, is again, new writers are like, oh, I got a contract, somebody loves me! And it's like that first boyfriend or girlfriend who really paid attention to you. And you know, yeah, they were stealing from your purse, they might beat you up a little bit, but they really loved you, okay? <laughs> so it's a very similar relationship. And the thing that you always have to ask is, are they doing anything for me that I couldn't do for myself? This is particularly true because more and more publishing is going to print on demand. So you're, a lot more publishers, small publishers, come to you and say, here is your publishing contract. And you look closely and you realize what they're going to do is print your book on demand and you're going to get 50% of the net royalties. Guess what? And no marketing. If you print it on demand, you get 80-90% of the royalties. Okay? And you're already going to do your own marketing anyways, so you have to be careful when you look at it to say, am I getting anything out of this other than to be able to say, I've got a publishing contract? Because more and more, it's less about being published and more about being read. Yeah. And one, thing, one of the reasons this makes such a big difference is a lot of times the reason you're going to go to a publisher and give up a lot of the money is that they're going to be able to perhaps get you into bookstores, perhaps to actually make you more discoverable to your readers. But if the publisher is only going to print as print on demand, those come with a different set of terms that make it highly unlikely a bookstore will ever carry it. Okay? Because if we're talking about an offset print run, traditional, public, traditional printing, 
then the, the, the sort of the market standard is that the bookstore can order copies, and if they don't sell, they can return them. And it costs the bookstore nothing, other than, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit of shipping, a little bit of man hours to process it, right? But print on demand, not only is the profit margin less for bookstores for a print on demand book to sell it, they can't return it, and so they're stuck with it forever, right? And so and bookstores are highly unlikely to carry a print on demand, but so what are you getting from that publisher? Yeah. Also, an awful lot of print-on-demand publications don't meet the same print quality standards as an offset printed volume, which means that they tend to fall apart, people tend to get dissatisfied with them. And they so you, look crappy. Right. So you basically are also getting a lower quality product, which means that if you're going to go that way, you ought to get a whole lot more money. Yeah. A percentage. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you, you want to understand what it is that publisher is doing for yes. you. If they're only print on demand an ebook, now it may be that you don't want to prepare the ebook. You don't want to format it. You don't want to format the print on demand, and that's the service they're offering you. Um, but understand that when you are signing away the percentages that you are. And if you keep if you keep those if all they're gonna do is provide editing service, provide a copy or a cover and a publishing name, guess what? You can do all that for under 500 bucks, easily. Yeah. You be the publisher yourself, and you hire the people to do that, and then you get to keep all of them. And sometimes it does make sense to go with them if they're gonna provide marketing, if they're credible. Like, I, I know Journal Stone is a small um, publishing house, and they do a lot of print on demand, but they have contacts with Publishers Weekly. All their stuff gets reviewed by Publishers Weekly. They have, they're very well known in the horror industry. Their books win awards in the horror industry, and all this adds up to copies sold. But if it's just some random publishing house that says, hey, and then you'll hear this, we're brand new, but we work hard, give us the rights, and we'll take care of you, and you won't have to worry about that stuff. 90% of the time, the translation for that is sign over your rights, and we'll give you a cover, moderate editing, and we will list you on our website. So if you don't like the contract, um, going back and saying, I don't like this part, this part, this part, that's kosher. That's Negotiating. Absol absolutely. Something you're going to find, there are certain provisions, especially with major publishers, that are not negotiable because it affects their bottom line. There are other things that are very much neg negotiable. And that goes into, what will I be thrilled with? What will I be content with? What do I walk away from? What sort of things are not negotiable? Oh, it depends on the publishing house. The bigger the publishing house, you'll notice the, the greater the number of non-negotiable things. Because if you don't want it as a new writer, they'll say, fine, suck it, I'll get somebody else. Okay. Well, but, mm -hmm. the other, but the other thing is, if you're talking a large publisher, they're also going to provide you yes. more, which means their overhead is higher. I mean, if you get picked up by a large publishing house, probably the minimum print, print run you're going to get is 5,000 copies in hardcover, maybe 4,000. That's their break-even point. Well, the point is, the 4,000 books from Tor, Benham, Daw, what have you, is going to be a lot more than 500 books from barely known independent. But that also means they're going to be pretty non-negotiable in terms of the advance that you get in terms of the cash advance for what they think that they can publish. Other terms, for example, may be much more negotiable in terms of subsidiary rights, foreign rights, and what have you, but, you, but it's going to be hard to negotiate away from that an initial lump sum contract ballpark. I mean, they can flex a little bit on it, but they're not going to budge much. But you can try. I, you know, it goes through lawyers, and they're used to negotiating. I mean, if you write a big X over all the pages, and then write like, "I want a million dollars, butthole," they're gonna, <laughs> that's not going to be helpful. But you know, if you redline stuff and say and write in language that you'd prefer, they're going to get it back, and then they'll send you a copy with explanations why this works, this doesn't. You'll. I mean, I've gone as an attorney. I've gone 30, 40 rounds, and it got 
frustrating at a certain point, but I rarely got mad about it because that's my job and that's who's handling. Now, if you go 30, 40 rounds, at some point they're gonna be like, this this person's already cost like eight thousand dollars in attorney's fees. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, you're 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 dealing probably with an editor if you're talking about traditional publisher. And that's just a lot of extra work for them. Yeah. Now, now, so as an example, though, so we talked earlier about option clauses in terms of having the next right refusal. If you get in a book published by a particular editor, that particular editor publishes probably a very narrow genre of fiction, right? But the boilerplate you may see in the contract says, your next work, regardless of whether it's no longer science fiction, it's romance, or it's okay. know, historical <clears throat> fiction. But what you that can, you need to narrow. But almost every major publisher, if you're going to write a rent, rent will have absolutely no problem saying your next work of okay. yep. romance fiction, hard science fiction, etc. That's pretty, they're used to that. Yeah. So yeah. you can basically, that's a, that's yeah, a easy narrative. I was like, if they get boilerplate that's just blank, that's one well, where you can... No, but that's, that. that's an important point because, for example, I'm with Tor, but Tor is part of the Macmillan group. And two years ago, Macmillan basically mandated that every single one of their subsidiaries, something like 15 subsidiaries under the von Holtzbrink label, all had to use the same boilerplate as a starter. So basically, you've got boilerplate in any Macmillan-based contract that is going to apply to everything from nonfiction to far-out chick fiction, et cetera, et cetera. And you just have to be aware of that and know that, yes, they will make allowances you just have to ask for it. But, and, and be aware, I do read far out chick fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to read that. That sounds awesome. Um, but seriously, just he's right. He asked for it. And, and it's okay just to redline stuff and send it back. They expect that. And they, and they might not agree, but that's okay. Could you know it as far as, you know, volume two, you know, if this turns into a series, you have the absolute right to option volumes 2 through X of this series, but I can write a different sci-fi or a different fantasy series to somebody else. That's negotiating. Yeah, you, you that, want that, to get it as narrow as possible, yeah. and narrowest is really the next book in this series. Right, that's but, how but far you, I would want to go. Yeah, but yeah, the, but that brings up non-compete clauses. And basically, if you're doing well for one given house, you're going to get language which says, your next book cannot be published within X months of um, not, so the I'm not saying clause, that you yeah. have to accept it, but I'm going to say you're going to get that language sent to you. So non-compete clause is sort of a, a, a clause that does very much the same thing we're talking about with an option clause. It says that you can't go and publish either yourself or publish somewhere else. Now, the purpose here is a little bit different. The purpose here is to make sure that you're spending your time writing books for them as opposed to writing books for someone else. They also want to make sure that basically you don't come out with another book a month or two after the one that you just bought from them. I mean, it doesn't apply to me, but basically I will agree to a non-complete clause that says I'm not going to give you another book, allow another book to be published within three months of the date of the publication of this one. I'm fine with that because I can only write two and a half books a year and three months doesn't matter much to me. But if you're somebody who writes a book a month, then it would matter a whole lot. Okay. Now, what Michael Brent brought up is that uh, the law generally does not like non-compete clauses. It does not like to restrict individuals from working. Okay, and so this applies both to the, 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 the non-compete clauses and also the, 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 the option clauses. I'm not sure what's ever been enforced in court, but one that short might be, right? And typically, we look at non-compete clauses. Once they get out to be beyond a certain number of years, of course, tend not to enforce them. Um, but still, if you're trying to get out of the contract in that way, you may have to like not publish anything for a couple of years, yeah. right? So That's to take care of it ahead of time. These, these can be, this, this can be a really bad well, trap. All, all I'm saying is just you need to look out for that, because that tends to get slipped in in about page 19 of 21 or 23 of 28. Oh, yeah. And believe me, the standard Macmillan contract is now 26 pages long, and that's not unusual. I signed a screenplay contract that was 100 pages long. Yeah, and, and, and they are spread out all over. So the grant clause, when you get it back, and these restrictions, option clause, they all work together to do one thing. And one of them's on the first page, another one's on page five, and then the other one's in a whole different place. Yeah. Yes, great. Hat. So my character, Thorvald. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the 
publishing contract. I'm what are some of the most egregious terms or uh, egregious clauses that you see? I mean, we've talked about a couple things, but what's the worst thing you've ever personally seen in a contract? I can't remember because I get rid of them so fast. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I look at it and I send them. And, and I literally, I sent back contracts that said, you know, I very nicely, I say, I, I'm not going to be able to go forward with this contract. They say, why? And I say, because paragraph six is so horrible. I, I, I'm an, I used to be an attorney and I would sue myself <laughs> for signing this contract. <laughs> if, um, actually, if you really want to see the really bad stuff, you go to the Hollywood contracts. <clears throat> Not the publishing contract. Right, so, yeah. so there's bad stuff you've got to watch out for publishing, but most of the people in the field are not, you know, evil. Okay, Hollywood, uh, maybe. Well, and here's the thing is, it's cheaper to buy stuff from you than it is to litigate with you. So most of these places are going to, you know, they, their bottom line is the bottom line. They're interested in money. And if you can point out how you're going to have a good relationship with them and that means more money down the line, if you can point out how this contract is fair to them but also fair to you, every contract, every good contract doesn't have to be a love fest, but it should be a win-win. Because right. if it's not, someone's going to walk away upset and you've ruined a potential business relationship. I, wrote, I, I um, sold a script that got turned into a horrific movie. And I watched it in the production office, like, because I was going to do the DVD extras. And I walk out, and all of the producers are standing there like this. And they go, what'd you think? And the only thing I can think is, that was so terrible. Your check cleared. I'd love another one of those checks. <laughs> So I didn't say, well, that stank like a dead man's butthole. I said, you know, it was really cool seeing my name there. The music was awesome. Let's talk about the music for a while. <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> there is a bottom line rule about movie, movie tie-ins on books. And it's very simple. Take the money and run. <laughs> Anytime you see net, that is code for you ain't seeing nothing. You're just not. In, in, he's talking about in, in Hollywood contracts, and net. Yeah. There are, you do want to look at the difference in the contract, whether your royalties are going to be based off of net or retail. Act, right. That's true, and with e-book contracts from the majors, the word net will appear. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's defined. Yeah. You they, want it defined, and what they do is this, the net is whatever they receive from the retailer. So if Amazon gives them 75% of the, of the, of the, of the of the, of the cost, that's the net. And so and that's so, acceptable. So if you get 25, 35, 50 percent of the net from Amazon, that's an honest net. That's groovy. Yeah, yeah they, can't, they can't be like movies and say, well, they'd actually never made any money. Well, I'm sorry about the that. thing is, they do make money, but they, the way they've got it, um, their accounting system keep, keeps their money. And again, listen, it's the bottom line. So, like, when I sell a movie, and I'm, I've got a movie deal that's that's oh, has been killing me because like we're working on it right now, and when I sell it, the one thing you don't want to do is sell it and then think, I should have gotten more. And this goes for books too. Like, get what you're happy with and then leave the rest alone. Walk however, away. However, I want to put one caveat in, into this. You don't get more in books than you sell in the long run. Not if you want to stay in this business. Yes, you can negotiate for much higher advance than the book will sell. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is that it's the bottom line. And if you negotiate for a million dollar advance and you only sell a half million dollars worth of books, they're on the whole for a half million bucks. And they're not going to be too inclined to be too charitable the next time around. You want to be in this for the long run. Don't be too unreasonable no matter what your market thing is yep. because let's say you say it's taken advance for 10,000, 15,000. It's your first novel. By the way, that's a damn good advance yep. for a first novel. Hmm. Take it because if you sell more than that, you still get the royalties. And they're going to be more inclined to be happy with you. Yeah. Can you quickly define some of these terms like advance and royalties? Tell me exactly, how does an author get paid? Okay. Why don't you take it for traditional and then I'll take it for self. Okay. Traditionally speaking, an advance is generally calculated by most, most 
publishers as the amount of money that book will bring in in the first year and a half. Some say a year, some say two years, but we use a year and a half. So if, in essence, your advance is calculated on what you would receive in the author's share of royalties, which generally speaking in a traditional hardcover is 10% for the first <clears throat> 5,000 copies, 12.5% for the next 5,000 copies, 15% <coughs> after the first 10,000 copies. What that book would bring in in the first year. That's what they calculate the advance on. It's generally paid in either, depending on the publisher, in two increments or three increments. Generally on the signing of the contract you get the first payment, and if it's a larger contract it'll be in three, it gets the second instrument, this installment gets paid when you deliver an acceptable manuscript, and the third gets paid upon uh, publication of the book. You then do not get any royalties until the number of copies sold earns out over your advance. So, if you're talking, and this won't happen, but if you are talking 100,000 sales, um, the first 10,000 copies on a $30 book is going to be $30,000. Okay, you've got to then sell, I'm not good at doing this in my head, but <laughs> roughly 60,000 or 30,000 more copies before you're going to get any money beyond that advance. Uh, yeah, that's the terminology, advance against royalties. That's right. And he's doing the, it's an advance against royalties. But the, one of the nice things about being an author is if you keep going, these things build up over the years and you keep getting royalties on your backlist. So as far as self-pub goes, it's, it's different because there's no advance because I'm doing it myself. I mean, I can give myself 50 bucks. I don't know. It might feel good. <laughs> you have, but you have to treat yourself as a business as well. So you have to calculate what your output is versus what you expect. Most self-pub books the great majority of them sell less than 100 copies, fewer than 100 copies. So you have to calculate, you're probably going to hit 20 copies, most of them to your mom. And so what kind of a cover, what kind of editing can you afford for that? And you're going to build, you'll build your audience over time to the point where you can output a certain level of, of good editing, of good cover, whatever you want. Um, but you're still going to deal with royalties and stuff because you're going to go on Audible and you're going to hire a narrator and give him 500 bucks to narrate your book and, and to produce it. And then you go to Audible and they've got a royalty rate. Their royalty rate, I don't even remember what it is, I've got it in my book somewhere. But they're going to give you that pass-through royalty and you've got to decide whether to sign with them exclusively. Oh, that's what it is. You sign with them exclusively for seven years and you get a 40% royalty rate. Sign with them non-exclusively and it's 25%. So you have to determine, and that's just a straight royalty. Self-pub's real easy because it's not even technically a royalty, it's just a pass-through. You're an independent contractor when you're, when you're a self-pub self -pub person. So you're gonna sell the, you're gonna give the licensing rights to Amazon, Audible, Nook, and they're gonna sell each unit and send you 30 to 70 percent of that total price depending on what, a whole bunch of factors. And now, once you get past the advanced stage, right, in traditional publishing, the what, uh, semi-annually for most traditional? Semi-annually. Semi they'll, they'll, they'll calculate, okay, how many books were sold, uh, and then, you know, send in the percentages. But they don't always have to, right? They may hold some of that back as a reserve against returns. Yes. Um, they, you know, it's, they may, there may be a bunch of books in print that are out of bookstores. They're thinking, you know, those might come back to us. Actually, and so we, we may we may hold on to some of this money as a reserve against possible returns. Thing being is that after you get your advance, don't really count on seeing any more money for a long, long time. Right. Can I talk about it if, on returns? Reserves on returns. Basically speaking, depending on the bigger the print run, the longer the bigger the reserves are going to be. You can figure that at least. 20% of the hardcover is going to come back unless you're a runaway bestseller. And so what do they do to that hardcover? 
That they actually get back. It's the mass no. markets that destroy. Yeah, okay, so talk about what they do, the hardcover and the mass market paperback, so they understand the... Okay, the, Hard co hardcover the is basically... The financials. Basically, <clears throat> what happens with the hardcover is it will come back to the publisher. They will keep a certain amount on in their warehouse, if you will, for probably a year, maybe a year and a half. Since they get taxed on it, they're not going to keep it forever. At which point, they're going to remainder. You get squat out of the remainder. Basically, the remainder goes to the publisher to hopefully cover some of the cost, the physical cost of production of that hardcover. But the hardcovers are around it for at least a little while. Paperbacks, on the other hand, mass market paperbacks, in essence, get pulped. What happens there is the bookstore gets a return on them. But the way they do that is they rip off the front covers because they don't want to pay the shipping for the entire mass market paper pack. They're stripped. And they get their money back based on the number of covers that they send back, not the whole thumb. <laughs> and the left rest of the book goes to the recycling plant, theoretically at least. So this is one of the reasons, and I'm going to take a little riff on this, but this is one of the reasons why the that and the combination of ebooks has almost totally destroyed, at least in science fiction, the mass market paperback market. In the 90s, if you were a moderate bestseller, you could probably count on a minimum of 100,000 paperbacks as a re mass market paperbacks as a reprint, at least in science fiction and fantasy. Today, that number, and this is assuming you're at least a mid-list or higher bestseller, that number is between 30 and 50,000, unless you're George R. R. Martin or maybe Brandon Sanderson. But for everybody else, you're only talking about 50,000 as opposed to what used to be several hundred thousand. Mass market paperback market has taken an incredible tank during that period of time. Now, I'm told that the e-book piracy thing isn't a problem. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh, that's I don't bull crap. Know. Yeah, that's I can tell you for sure. I like I Google my name, and the first thing that comes up is a bunch of people in Thailand selling my book for free. Oh, I, I <laughs> the same thing. Something like 80 percent of googling my name is torrents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The e-book has really just like it's to some degree screwed the music industry, it's also screwed the writing industry. Questions? Uh, yes, nice lady in the front. Would you recommend for writers to get attorneys of their own when they're signing contracts? It depends, which is a good attorney answer. I would say if you've got like a, if you're like, I'm an, I was a contract attorney, so I feel fairly secure. But even this deal that I'm working on, I've got an attorney. You know why? Because I don't want to be the jerk. I want somebody else being the jerk. <laughs> so I can, I can talk to the attorney and tell her like, this sucks, I want you to get this, 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 and this. And she can walk up and go, speaking of my own and with no input from my client, <laughs> you guys are a-holes, you know? <laughs> So, but if you're a new writer and you're signing a two-page contract with a small publisher, maybe you can figure that out. And you don't have to be the jerk because you'll have a cordial back and forth. Um, as soon as you get, you're get, you getting into big money and a large lack of understanding, get an attorney. You're going to save money. Yeah, so to, to, when, when you do that, um, <clears throat> get because remember, right. an attorney's going to bill, you know, I think I generally bill $200, $250 an hour, and I, I can bill that low because I work at my, Super I, cheap. It's, I'm super, super, super cheap, but I have a day job that pays my bills, and I just do this for fun. But people would say go get an intellectual property attorney, for example. You have to be careful there because 95% of intellectual property attorneys, people who call themselves that, are patent attorneys, and they don't know squat about... Uh, the publishing industry, even if they maybe know a little bit about copyrights. So you have to find someone who knows the industry as well. Um, but the other resources, I mean, I, you, other experienced authors, if you know them, will be familiar with, with what, uh, what these are, what, what are the things to look out for. I mean, so that might be a, an approach you can take if you don't want to spend, you know, $500 or more to get an attorney to look at. Also, 
CIFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America, has an online page which gives a lot of cautions for beginning writers, and a lot of it deals with some of those, the, the border, call it the boilerplate legal issues. And it's worth looking at, even if you do go for an attorney, because you'll at least understand a little bit more what to ask for and what, what the problems are. Yeah, oh, and that's, that's a great point, because if you do get an attorney, don't like hand the attorney the contract and go, help me. Okay, because the attorney's, the attorney, you know what an attorney's number one priority is? The law, to get paid. Number two priority, <coughs> to not get sued, get brought before the bar, or go to jail. Number three, distant three, you. Okay. <laughs> so, if you just hand the person your contract and hope for the best, it's going to be a far less good outcome than if you hand it to the attorney and go, here are my concerns. In addition to those concerns, do you see anything else that's going to cause trouble down the line? At that point, the attorney's actually going to engage. Do you have an agent, then what's your involvement with the uh, whole process and the contracts and stuff? You're still the boss. You know what agent means? It means they're you. They work for you. But they give you the mean guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's fantastic because you can really screw up relationships. Anything else on agent? But you're the boss. If they come back and say, I think this is a wonderful deal, you can go, I don't like it. I, I just turned down a six-figure deal, and my manager was like, please. And I said, no, it's a terrible deal. Yeah. Oh, but by the way, if you go to Hollywood, if you're talking about Hollywood, yes, get an army of attorneys. <laughs> I mean, I, you, I, that, I, that I don't think you can ever go alone. I know you said it's that. So let's say that you're offered an advance. Is there anything you should look at in the advance in terms of, you know, you could write the work and then they'll publish it. Is there something that you need to look out for in, in those scenarios? Yeah, so um, what, what we, if, you, if the typical contract in the U.S. at least, you're generally conveying the rights forever and then there's some, there's clause, the reversion clause, right? Print clause that says when you can get the copyright back. There should also be a clause in there that, that conditions the grant of the copyright to the publisher on them actually publishing it. And so what you'll see language is, is well, you uh, for example, I got a sample up here of a contract that says, um, this period of this grant shall be for 12 years. However, if the publisher shall publish or arrange to publish the hardcover trade paperback, da, 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 then it goes to the library. In other words, you want, uh, the, you have to give them two or three years at a minimum. The standard Macmillan contract says they have to publish it within 24 months yeah. of signing of the contract. And that's pretty standard. Yeah. So, so you'll probably, but you do want to see that, especially if you go with a smaller publisher who might just up and vanish, right? Um, and it's not in there. And technically, they still own the rights, even though you can't find them. They've never published it. And you want to get paid anyways. Yeah. If they don't publish it, you don't want to have to give them their money back. Oh, God. Especially if it's the first in the series. Can you imagine? Right? <laughs> it's just out there in limbo. You, yeah. you went ahead and wrote the second and third books and you can't publish the first. Um, so, what was the name of that dictionary that you mentioned? Black's Dictionary. Black's Dictionary? Yeah. E -E -C -K. Now, I, I'm not sure that Black's Law Dictionary is necessarily going to have a lot of the industry terms that are very important in contracts. So it's going to have a lot of legal terms that are that, 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 uh, that is helpful. But in terms <laughs> of learning, because a lot of the contract is actually just specific uh, uh, language that has meaning in the industry, not necessarily that would not necessarily. It's not law terms. Yeah, yeah. I, so there are other places you can go. You I can. haven't looked at it recently, but the CIFWA page used to have a model contract on it, which CIFWA recommended for science fiction authors uh, as to what a model contract should have. There, there are a couple books out there. So there, there's two main books that are out there, three I would say right now. One is Kirsch's Guide to the Book Contract. This is what it looks like. Uh, that's what the cover looks like. Kirsch's, K-I-R-S-C. If you search book contract in Amazon, you'll find it. Um, this one's pretty dense. Uh, Kirsch's is pretty dense. It goes through the language word by word of the contract. It's not specific to genre fiction. And it was originally written in the early 90s. Now, it has been updated, but um, just be aware of that. Another, the other two that you might look at are, there's another one by Levine, Mark L. Levine, Negotiating a Book Contract. Now this one doesn't have a lot of specific language. It's called Negotiating a Book Contract by Mark Levine. 
but it does hit like all of the negotiation points that you want to watch out for. Okay, so, and, and it, it, there's not a lot of explanation in this one. A lot of the chapters are just bullet points, <laughs> okay? But it, it, it's another starting point. Um, another potential one that I don't have a, uh, 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 a picture of is Deal Breakers by Kristen Catherine Rush. Um, now, Dean Wesley Smith and Kristen Catherine Rush have very specific views about how you should publish and where you should publish. Okay, so you kind of want to know going in that they're very anti-agent, they're very pro-indie, um, but they're also very, very smart. <laughs> okay, and so it's just that her book, Deal Breakers, is another place um, that she would want to look at. Uh, as well. Regarding yeah. Deal Breakers, she, she, she also, she also yeah. used to have a series of article, articles about publishing and deals on, on her She website. still does. Every Thursday she does a business one called the, the Business Rush. Uh, ChrisWrights.com. Yeah, okay. what? Yeah, Chris, it, yeah, Chris with a K. K-R-I-S, rights.com is her website. And every Thursday she does a business, and it's far ranging. And a lot of times she'll collect them in the books and stuff. But like I said, they're very strong <coughs> indie publishing uh, and doing it yourself. But she's also just really, really smart, and she's worked at all levels of publishing. I do follow her, and she's been talking a lot lately about how for new writers to go indie, that it, you know, for anybody starting out now, it's looking like. Is this going, a question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you guys think? <laughs> if you were starting out today. Gotta make sure. What would you do? I. I what, the answer I say is keep your options open. Okay. In other words, that, that a lot of people coming in now are thinking hybrid is the best way to go. And and by doing this, you've got to watch your the, the option clauses, the non-compete clauses. If you do sign one with the so that you can you can do both. Now, I I love the Mosley Smith and Kirsten Catherine Rush. I mean, I, I I've taken classes from them. I, I read them religiously. I always want their opinions and everything. They don't have the same discoverability issues that a new author does. In other words, they are no names, they have established fan bases, and so they can do it quite well indeed. Um, that, that may not be as true for a new author. Now, uh, but that's not to say that they, they're not aware of that, right? Chris has written a whole like three month series on discoverability and different ways to do it. Um, here, here's my thought is like obviously I'm an indie writer so I do self pub and everything like that and I make a living at it and I'm very happy with it but you if you're an indie well regardless if you're an author you have to treat yourself as a business so I make a certain amount of money on my books and I've had publishing offers and I've had to say no I make far more on my own okay if the right publishing offer came down and they either said we're gonna provide a huge advance and a good percentage or a medium advance and bitchin' marketing, and I knew, and I got marked. By the way, if they just say we're gonna market you, that's nothing. You have to get exact terms in the contract, okay? Um, then I might take it because I'm not anti public like traditional publishing. I am just pro money. Yeah. No, I mean, but, but look and see, you can see people who have been have been definite in these successes who have then gone and signed traditional publishing contracts. People, who, some of the most successful indie people out there, Hugh authors, Howie, Hugh Howie, uh, have gone and done, and and they have reasons. Yeah, they have reasons for for doing that because they can reach different people than they have otherwise uh, previously reached. Okay, this also brings up a related point, and that is, <coughs> what kind of person are you? I know that sounds odd in a contractual situation, but okay, if you're like Michael Brent here, he obviously loves doing all of this shit. <laughs> um, if you're a little bit more like me, what I really like doing is writing. And I'm not much into the deals. As long as I can make a really nice living writing, that's what I want to do. Well, each of you has to make that kind of decision because that affects your contracts, the way you run your life, and what makes you happy. I mean, if you end up doing everything and you're unhappy as hell because all of the everything is getting in the way, you don't want to do it that way. The contract, one of the things is what you engage in contractually should be in accord with the kind of person you are. And a lot of people don't look at this. That's a great, you know, you will say you want to be a writer when you grow up, and most people think that means like sitting on the porch and watching the sunset and think writerly thoughts, maybe write a little bit too because you're a writer. Um, but it, it's just buttloads of work, and the question is like, 
do you want this kind of work? Do you want this kind of work? You know, because he's totally right. If you're miserable as a writer, then your dream sucks. But, but it's also, if you're miserable, what makes you miserable? In other words, most people would not work the hours I work. I mean, basically, I sit down at the typewriter, at the computer. <laughs> I, I start on a typewriter. Yeah. I never did handwriting. I start at the computer at 9 in the morning. The first hour is business, emails, and what have you. Then it's writing. And basically, I write until 7 to 9 at night. There's a little time off for chores or what have you. I do this six days a week. Okay. I like doing this. I've worked for other people. I don't ever want to work for other people again. But it's a particular kind of life. And if you don't want to do that, get something else. Is it contract specific question? Uh, contract specific question. Anybody got a contract specific question? Because we're running out of time. Yes. Do they ever include, um, part of my naivete, but um, do they ever include uh, sections where they specify a time limit for your edits? Yes. yes. Okay. Generally, spe generally speaking, they will actually put a date on a contract or give you three months or something like that. But every contract generally will have a requirement <coughs> that you deliver an acceptable manuscript by such and such a time. That's pretty standard. And, and that, that's for screenplays too. Like, if you're really lucky, you'll sell a script. I mean, it's it's an amazing feat to sell a script. If you're really really lucky, you get the rewrites. Rewrites are like they're guilty money almost because it's so much less work, and you still get really good money. But um, so you take it. So, um, <laughs> but they usually have you know you're going to sign this, and then within eight weeks of being asked, you'll turn in the script. Two weeks after that, you turn in the first rewrite. Two weeks after that, turn in the second rewrite. So no matter what, like if it's something that's going to affect them, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going to be in there in writing. Yeah, now, what you want to also watch out for is that you want there to be time limits on them as well. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times it'll say you have to fill their manuscript, and then, uh, as Lee pointed out, that the second part of your advance is paid when they deem it acceptable. But if there's not any sort of time limit in there, you could deliver the manuscript and the editor could be like, well, I can't get to it until right. next year. Super busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and the same with uh, rights of first refusal. You send them, okay, you send them your next book and they have the right of first refusal. There would need to be time limits on that as well. Otherwise, they just, you know, two years go by and like, I'll get to it. Okay. One quick addition to that. In terms of getting money, which is contracts also, if you're dealing with a large publisher, you can figure if there's going to be a delay between the time you sign that contract and you get the check. They have a bureaucracy. It's going to be between two and six weeks. If it's more than six weeks, scream. Totally. I have two quick questions. One is on Let's start taxes. Right at do, they, do, do publishers normally take taxes out or not? No. no. And then my second one is if I, I wanted to find an attorney and I couldn't remember Mr. Boone's name, what type of attorney again do I look for? I mean, I know I ask them questions. You've you, you, you got to find somebody who, who, who's it, done publishing work. Is there a is there like special initials for that? <laughs> no, no, there's not. But you can look on their website, and most attorneys have a list of articles. They have clients. So if you see an attorney who's an IP attorney who says IP. whose IP is intellectual property, okay. and his website lists Microsoft versus Amgen, twenty million dollar settlement article, the bio corruption kept present in the patent number. So he's the wrong kind of attorney. He's a patent attorney. Okay, and you want somebody who's who's got how to wheel and deal your way into an agent, how to deal successfully with Harper Collins, you know, stuff that's specific to books or to screenplays or whatever area you're dealing with. Because here's the other thing about attorneys, they lie. <laughs> but but on the other <laughs> hand, if there's an article which which is contract litig like litigation in the American Law Journal. The odds are they probably know a little something about yeah, the no, kind but of yes. Yeah, and now, um, other place you might look is most states or, or large metropolitan cities have volunteer lawyers for the arts, uh, VLAs. Uh, now, typically they deal with uh, artists, but they deal with musicians and they deal with writers. And uh, attorneys who do specialize in that will sometimes join to be members to, to get referrals. You can look up, like, on Law Finder or... Uh 
Uh, Westlaw.com, I think, has some outside stuff that you're allowed to look at, even though you don't pay a fee, where you can say, I want a IP, you know, these keywords, IP, book, <coughs> publishing, and then this city and this place, and, and they'll bring it up. But talk to them, too. Ask for, you know, references. Don't, the, the thing about the lie is like, oh, yeah, I totally do this kind of litigation. And, like, all they know how to do is something dealing with cows, you know, but they need the money. So you want to say, well, who have you represented? Oh, I've represented uh, like people in contract disputes with Macmillan. I've represented people who worked with Time Warner. You know, and, and so you understand it. Write it down. If you don't know who that is, go, who is that? Okay. Yeah, to, Thank to, be, you. To, to show you as an example, so uh, when I first got out of law school, I worked in the largest IP boutique in the Southeast. Okay? Um, and after the first three months, uh, Everyone working there brought all the copyright stuff to me because none of the rest of them did it, right? So I was looking at contracts. I mean, that's just to show you <coughs> how few actually, because there's really no money in it, okay? <laughs> I mean, I mean, there, you cannot really build a practice off of representing authors. So you just because they're too freaking poor. Because there's just there's, there's no there's no. Well, let's put it this way: they're too poor. And there's only a handful that have the money that can pay it. Yeah. And those guys generally don't get screwed because they do have enough money. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's, our time is up. So really quick, would you like to make a closing statement or pitch or tell us where you're going to be? Not really. I'm going to be here. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I do. There's a panel this afternoon at 3 p.m. called Learning the Lingo 101 and 201, the Family and Conversation. I think it's aimed both at, at art and, and at writing as well. So. Um, there'll be similar sorts of discussions there as well. I'm in the vendor's room, and I have Google's of books there if you want to come up and look at them. The cool books, jacket. Yeah, the cool jacket. The books are free, but my signature on them costs $15. Um, <laughs> and I have bookmarks and, and some business cards if you guys want to come up. Thank you guys, you've been great.